हेलो एवरी वन एंड वेलकम टू दिस सेशन ऑफ ई एन टी आई होप यू एम ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल टू ऑल ऑफ यू इफ येस काइंडली गिव मी अ क्विक कन्फर्मेशन If you are able to see me and listen to me, just let me know. Good evening, Prince. <coughs> If you are able to see me and listen to me, just let me know. Good evening, Prince. Okay, so today's session. Now we are going to do some MCQs for the upcoming FMG examination. so i cannot uh, tell you like these are 100% sure shot questions because i am not the one who is setting the paper but uh, at least based upon the last 5 years recall the subjects or the topics that is very important the sub topics that are very important i am going to discuss them in this class so uh, we will begin the class very shortly let me just briefly tell you what we have on an academy for you we have something called as medbinds ultra combat 2.0 this is a examination curated for year 1 year 2 3 and 4 as well as interns and post interns there will be 50 questions which will have to be solved in 60 minutes and all those who perform extremely well in this would be getting wonderful prizes as um, you know as a token of appreciation and this is going to happen on 27th of november at 12 pm please do enroll and use the code ent live to enroll into the classes okay so you can take up this uh, exam which will help you we have a uh, rapid revision batch which has a strike rate of more than 85% in the neat pg 2022 examination so this year we are launching neat pg uh, 2023 achievers batch which is again a rapid revision with mcq so last time when we did a revision batch we saw that this was the strike rate so we are hoping that we get a similar or a better strike rate this year as well so this is happening on november uh, 21st and the duration is for 4 months so we will have a very quick and a rapid revisions of most subjects of all the 19 subjects in this entire course we will have ibqs we will have pyqs we will have topic wise test subject wise test grand test and you will also have doubt solving sessions included to access this course for 4 months you have to pay 12250 and you can use the code ent life to get a 10% off we have prof to package where uh, we are introducing a recorded playlist and a live batch so we will have a recorded uh, you know batch that will have already the content and the live batch will be there to uh, you know supplement the content that is already there so that students can ask us doubts or they can ask us whatever they want this is live now and this is um, uh, this you can subscribe for 3 months at a very nominal price of 4000 rupees again you can use the code ent live uh, to get a 10% off we have recorded play content playlist live on the platform with 370 plus hours we have live batch starting on november 15 the mnemonics used by by dr nikita nanwani so with this introduction let me quickly tell you uh, the questions that i have put forward for your practice so let's sa start solving what does o sign in a pure tone audiogram indicate air conduction of the right ear air conduction of the left ear bone conduction of the right ear bone conduction of the left ear <coughs> good evening mukesh dr v so what does o sign on a pure tone audiogram indicate please tell me in the chat box what is your answer okay so snow is saying one what about others any other answers so whenever we use the symbol for air conduction the symbols used are zero and x 
zero is for sorry it is x so zero is for air conduction of the right ear and x is for air conduction of the left ear so zero symbol that we use is for the air conduction of the right ear and x is for the air conduction of the left ear so the o sign in the pyotone audiogram indicates air conduction of the right ear for bone conduction what are the symbols that we have so for bone conduction we have either lesser than or greater than open bracket or closed bracket so lesser than and open bracket are for right ear greater than and closed bracket are for your left ear so these are the symbols that are used for right and left ear right ear is typically depicted in red color left ear is depicted in blue color okay so these are the symbols that we use in pure tone audiogram this test is used for pathology of external ear middle ear mastoid air cell system in earlier so i'm waiting for your answers okay so what you see here is a probe that has been placed in the external auditory canal it has a signal for sound source you will have the sound source coming through the probe going and hitting the tympanic membrane while we also alter the pressure in the canal some amount of the uh, impulses are gone into the middle ear and some amount of them are reflected back the reflected impulses are taken and they are connected to a machine which we call it as impedance audiometer based upon which we will get certain graph we will get either a a type of graph an as type of graph a d type of graph b type of graph or c type of graph so basically these graphs explain to you what is the problem in the middle ear so these graphs are meant for middle ear pathologies a is normal as is seen in otosclerosis ad is seen in ossicular discontinuity b is seen whenever there is fluid in the middle ear and c type is seen whenever there is a eustachian tubal obstruction so this test is used for the pathology of the middle ear now let's go to the next question the picture shows malignancy of the external ear caused by h influenza blackish mass of aspergillus pseudomonas infection of the ear seen in diabetics i am waiting for your answers i'll give you a clue there is uh, typically some granulation tissue in the bony cartilaginous junction so what do you think is the answer if you have a granulation tissue so i'll answer the question where do you see granulation in the external auditory canal typically at the bony cartilaginous junction so when you have granulation tissue in the external auditory canal typically at the bony cartilaginous junction which are pale it is suggestive to you of pseudomonal infection so it is a pseudomonas infection which is seen in elderly diabetics we call that condition as malignant otitis externa so we they call this condition as malignant otitis externa so what is malignant otitis externa it is a pseudomonal infection seen in elderly and seen in diabetics we call this condition as malignant otitis externa which of the following is characterized by vertigo without hearing loss bppv vestibular neuronitis meniere's disease a and b are true b and c are true
so prince davis says b uh, bppv smith says a what about others any other option that you think is right okay before we go to the answer quickly let us understand what is happening in the basic pathogenesis of bppv there is displacement of the otolith from the ampullated end of the semicircular canal into the semicircular canal duct here the semicircular canals are involved is the cochlea involved no so the cochlea is not involved what is happening in vestibular neuronitis there is inflammation of vestibular nerve so inflammation of only vestibular nerve so if we go to the inner ear anatomy we have a central chamber called as the vestibule anteriorly you have the cochlea posteriorly you have the semicircular canals so the impulses from the utricle saccule and the semicircular canal are finally transmitted by the vestibular nerve and the impulses from the cochlea are transmitted by the cochlear nerve so when there is inflammation of the vestibular nerve we call it as vestibular neuronitis so if there is inflammation of only vestibular nerve and cochlear nerve is not involved will there be hearing loss there will be no hear loss now in meniere's disease it is an endolymphatic hydrops the entire endolymph which is present in your inner ear is excessively produced or decreasedly there is a decreased resorption so the increased pressure in the entire inner ear whether you take the vestibule whether you take the cochlea whether you take the semicircular canal the pressure in your inner ear has increased so all the three components are affected as a result they will have vertigo sensory neural hearing loss <coughs> and tinnitus so the answer question says vertigo without hearing loss so can i say a and b are true because in bppv and vestibular neuronitis you do not get hearing loss so that is the answer posterior nasal packing is indicated in all of the following situations except severe posterior epistaxis anterocoinal polyp reactionary post adenoidectomy bleeding after removal of nasopharyngeal angiofibroma okay so answer this question so smith patel says b what about others what's your answer okay so what is posterior nasal packing if you occlude the nose as well as nasopharynx we call this as posterior nasal packing so posterior nasal packing is occlusion of the nose and nasopharynx we call it as posterior nasal packing so if we have a patient on whom we have done an adenoid surgery so if there is bleeding from the adenoid site do we have to do a posterior packing because unless you occlude the nasopharynx the bleeding will not stop or there will be no pressure on the site of surgery so you will have to do a posterior nasal packing for a post adenoidectomy bleeding now a patient with severe posterior epistaxis there is bleeding that is happening posteriorly so if there is a posterior epistaxis do you have to do posterior nasal packing yes you have to do posterior nasal packing anterocoinal polyp now anterocoinal polyp is an inflammatory condition they are pale edematous masses because of chronic inflammation and it occurs because of streptococcal infection now polyps can bleed but usually in the options that are given over here they are less often known to cause bleeding or that might require a posterior nasal packing so anterocoinal polyps are typically inflammatory after removal of nasopharyngeal angiofibroma angio as the name suggests is extremely vascular fibroma is a tumor 
so if you are removing a benign tumor which is extremely vascular you will have to do a prophylactic packing because that can ag again trigger bleeding so to prevent the bleeding from the nasopharynx you will do a posterior nasal packing antrocoinal polyp is an inflammatory condition so the possibility or the requirement is very very remote or less allergic rhinitis is characterized by all of the following except attacks of sneezing mucoid rhinorrhea antrocoinal polyp pale bluish nasal mucosa so i'm waiting for your answers <coughs> allergic rhinitis is characterized by all of the following except okay very good mukesh so basically just now i have told you antrocoinal polyp is a inflammatory disease caused by an infection which is streptococcus pneumonia so antrocoinal polyp is infective in origin it is caused by streptococcus pneumonia whereas you have in allergies sneezing watery nasal discharge pale turbinates all these are signs that you see in allergic rhinitis so antrocoinal polyp is mainly infective but if you had to talk of allergic polyps allergic polyps are ethmoidal polyps so which polyps are allergic in etiology if you see polyps coming from the ethmoidal air cells we call them as allergic polyps okay tudicum speculum is used to visualize tonsils larynx anterior nasal cavity posterior nares so you see there is a speculum here what is this speculum used for i think this is a very simple question and most of you should be able to answer i'm waiting for your answers i'm looking in my phone for the answers mukesh chahar says see what about others very good that's the answer it is used for anterior rhinoscopy so to decomps nasal speculum is used for anterior rhinoscopy so what is anterior rhinoscopy <coughs> if you visualize the anterior part of the nose with the help of by opening the nasal cavity with the help of to decomps nasal speculum we call it as anterior rhinoscopy so you will hold the speculum you are going to insert it in the patient's vestibule of the nose and open it so you will get a better vision of what is happening inside the nose you will be able to see the septum you will be able to see the lateral wall of the nose with middle and inferior turbinates you cannot see the superior turbinate this is another speculum which is used but this is called as kilian's nasal speculum okay this is the kilian's nasal speculum this can also be used for anterior rhinoscopy to visualize the tonsils you will use a tongue depressor so a tongue depressor is used to visualize the tonsil and for visualizing the posterior nares what will you use this instrument that is used for posterior rhinoscopy is called as st clair thompson posterior rhinoscopic mirror so this instrument is called as st clair thompson's posterior rhinoscopic mirror so i think you got a good understanding of few instruments through this question a 45 year old male with a history of nasal blockade for 6 months on examination the patient uh, had a nasal mass with mucin discharge what is the probable diagnosis based upon the ct scan so you are seeing something in the ct scan what is that based upon the ct scan 
I'm waiting for your answers. I'm waiting for your answers guys. <coughs> so Prince Davis says C. So I want to show you something. There are areas which are white and areas which are grey. So this grey and white areas, we call them as double densities. So grey and white area are called as double densities. So presence of double densities is suggestive of allergic fungal sinusitis. Whenever you get double densities, without any doubt, you must answer allergic fungal sinusitis because the fungus contains chitin in its wall and this chitin will be radio opaque appearing white on a CT or an X-ray. So those white areas are fungal lesions that you can see in between mucinous discharge which appears grey. So if you get double densities, you must think about allergic fungal sinusitis. The next question, the current treatment of choice for a large antrochoinal polyp in a 10 year old is intranasal polypectomy, cardwell luck operation, FES, latin rhinotomy and excision. Mukesh Chahar says C, what about others? Yes, so for any polyp, whether it is antrochoinal polyp, whether it is ethmoidal polyp or whether it is chronic sinusitis, the treatment of choice is functional endoscopic sinus surgery. FES stands for functional endoscopic sinus surgery so where you are trying to preserve the mucosa as much as possible to retain the function okay so to retain the function we call function of the nose you preserve the nasal mucosa as much as possible you do it with the help of endoscope you widen the drainage of the sinus uh, ostiums and you clear the disease from the sinuses that is called as fess now identify these fracture. There is a fracture where there are three fracture lines. Can you tell me what is this? Anybody? This is also called as tripod fracture. Tripod fracture is nothing but zygomatic fracture. So whenever you have a trauma to this bone which is your zygoma, you will usually have three fracture lines at the fronto, zygomatic suture, zygomatico maxillary suture and zygomatico mastoid suture. So this fracture is called as tripod fracture which is nothing but zygomatic fracture. Can you tell me what is the, what fracture is this and what is the name given to this sign? Prince Davis, Lee Ford's fractures are maxillary fractures, not zygomatic fractures. Okay, so Lee Ford, we have 1, 2 and 3, they are maxillary fracture. One is floor of the nose and floor of the maxillary sinus. Two is a pyramidal fracture running from the nasion, medial wall of the orbit and maxilla. Three is craniofacial disjunction, meaning the cranial cavity is getting separated from facial cavity. That is Lee Fort 1, 2 and 3 which are for maxilla. Tripod is for zygoma. Now the fracture that you see here is called as blowout fracture. This blowout fracture is the fracture that you see in the floor of the orbit. And the sign given here is called as the teardrop sign. Okay, so the sign here is teardrop sign. 
Now, what is the pathognomonic test for CSF leak? Because CSF leak has come as a question in the last three, four years, very, very often in FMG, I have given you this question. So, what is the pathognomonic test for CSF leak? Is it the glucose concentration test, handkerchief test, halo sign, or beta two transferrin? Good luck, guys. Answer quickly. Okay, very good, uh, Mukesh Adil. Correct. The pathognomonic test for diagnosing CSF leak is beta 2 transferrin. Other tests are done for distinguishing CSF from nasal fluid, but one that will tell you very clearly that this is nasal fluid or this is CSF is beta 2 transferrin. Target sign is suggestive of traumatic CSF rhinorrhea, spontaneous CSF rhinorrhea, angiofibroma, or glomus tympanicum. Yes, you are right, Prince Davis. Very good. Target sign is you get a central red dot. Surrounding the red dot, you will have a peripheral halo. So, this central red dot surrounded by peripheral halo, we call this sign as target sign. And what is target sign? Where do you see this? You see this in traumatic CSF rhinorrhea. So you don't get this sign in spontaneous CSF rhinorrhea, you get this sign in traumatic CSF rhinorrhea. The current treatment of choice for a large anthroquinal polyp in a 10 year old is intranasal polypectomy, Caldwell acopration, FES, lateral rhinotomy and excision. Adil, uh, yes, sub question aayega kya uh, is a question that nobody can really answer to. But yes, we are trying to cover the most important topics uh, from where questions have been asked in the last five years at least. So that you are prepared with those topics and those questions are revised very quickly. And we are doing very short sessions. So we cannot guarantee you that yes, these are the questions which will come in exams because we are not the ones who will set the questions. Okay, we've done this question which is functional endoscopic sinus surgery. A middle-aged diabetic with tooth extraction and ipsilateral swelling over the middle third of the sternocleidomastoid muscle is seen and there is displacement of tonsil towards the contralateral side. So what is the diagnosis? Parapharyngeal abscess, retropharyngeal abscess, Ludwig's angina, none of the above. <laughs> So whenever you get a unilateral bulge of tonsil, so they're telling you displacement of tonsil, only one tonsil. So when you have a unilateral bulge of tonsil, you have to think of two differential diagnoses. The two differential diagnoses to be considered is number one, parapharyngeal abscess. Number two, retropharyngeal abscess. So, parapharyngeal and retropharyngeal abscess. In, sorry, not retropharyngeal, peritonsillar abscess. So, either it is a parapharyngeal abscess or a peritonsillar abscess. So, in parapharyngeal abscess, there is an associated neck swelling. So, there will be a swelling in the upper third of the upper and the middle third of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. In peritonsillar abscess, there is no neck swelling. So, the answer here is parapharyngeal abscess. In retropharyngeal abscess, if you take this as the midline, on the side of midline, you will get a bulge. 
that is what you see in retropharyngeal abscess ludwig's angina is a cellulitis of the submandibular space so cellulitis of this space we call it as ludwig's angina here there will be nothing in relation to tonsil the tongue is pushed upwards and backwards you wouldn't see any uh, disease in relation to the tonsil a patient presents to you with hyperacusis loss of lacrimation loss of taste sensation from anterior two thirds of the tongue injury extends up to which level of the facial nerve horizontal part vertical part proximal to nerve to stapedius vertical part beyond the nerve to stapedius proximal to the geniculate ganglion I'm waiting for your answers. So I'll give you a clue. The first branch which comes from the first genu is the greater superficial petrosal nerve. the second branch that comes is the nerve to stapedius the third branch that comes is the corda tympani nerve and then it gives rise to secretomotor fibers to the submandibular and the sublingual salivary glands and then finally five terminal branches <coughs> so if i have a patient who has a lesion proximal to the first genu will gspn function no so will there be lacrimation or no lacrimation there will be no lacrimation will nerve to stapedius function no so as a result will the sound impulses going from the middle ear to inner ear be regulated they won't be regulated as a result there will be more sounds going into the inner ear and the patient will have hyperacusis when there is corda tympani not functioning the patient will have loss of taste sensation so even all the three are not functioning you will have hyperacusis loss of lacrimation and loss of taste sensation so the region the lesion is proximal to the first genu okay so the lesion is proximal to the first genu nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is characterized by all of the following except again nasopharyngeal angiofibroma and carcinoma are two very important topics that uh, you can expect questions coming from lm and type of facial paralysis recurrent severe epistaxis occurs in adolescent boys may cause frock face deformity so all of them can be seen in angiofibroma except so in angiofibroma we have a mass that is in the nasopharynx and this originates from the sphenopalatine and foramen and goes into the nasopharynx so it can erode the sphenoid sinus and enter the cavernous sinus so when it enters the cavernous sinus and the sphenoid sinus the nerves that could probably get involved are second third fourth ophthalmic and maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve and the sixth nerve <coughs> seventh nerve will not be involved angiofibroma as the name suggests will cause epistaxis because it's a vascular condition it is a tumor seen exclusively in males and can cause <coughs> <coughs> sorry proc face deformity where there is widening of the nasal bridge swelling of the cheek and proptosis of the eye we call this as proc face deformity so what you don't see is an element type of facial paralysis with this i finish my class i hope you found this class useful <coughs> i hope to see you for more classes on an academy take care